the 666 Black Hearts has been achieved. It's a big
believe I made this intro. That uh, it's ancient Hellenic for uh, here's luck. A greeting uh, I read about in uh, some magazine for the Church of Satan. The voice I'm doing here, the abrupt staccato one, is probably inspired by uh, the Amanda Galas. We listened a lot to one of the 1986 uh, albums that she uh, did uh, in these times. The whole intro was probably the way I felt at the time. I had to make something. Here we go. Go, go, go! Ugh. Sounds exactly like our wonky cassette version of uh, Vader's Nicholas demo that Ted got from some uh, trader down from Poland in probably 1989 or 90. I don't think Vader did the bass drum rolling that I used to do way back here. And that's the mid-tempo. It always works like a charm after some uh, twice as fast rhythms. Go! We never rehearsed uh, with vocals and um, I had no idea what kind of vocals that this album would end up having when we uh, recorded the uh, the whole shebang in the same studio that uh, Mayhem did uh, Death Crush by the way it uh, was a very a very expensive but still very local studio to both us and Mayhem and it's like five minutes away from where I grew up on, on the bicycle so I was just there the other <laughs> day just playing football not being in the studio of course I don't know what they use the studio for now Anyway, I didn't know what the vocals were supposed to sound like and when we recorded the, the album I guess I just uh, well my parts were done I did the intro I did the uh, drums uh, and then I just drank myself into oblivion and Ted wanted to be uh, alone with the vocals and then uh, I woke up uh, probably in some side room of the studio on the couch and the vocals were done and I was like, okay. Good one, Ted. Celtic Frost uh, riffs right here. A lot of Celtic Frost in this uh, song. It's no battery until like the last riff or something. Best drum sound we ever had. Eric Anskog, he also did the drum sound for uh, Death Crush by Mayhem. They recorded like in December 86 or like early 87 or something and this was in the summer of 91. We finally had the money to go there. Never had a better drum sound than this. Guitars were played like through a tiny amplifier but with a effect board that was the uh, size of Texas. Lots of uh, reverb here, both on drums and uh, guitars. And it was like a question if Dog should play on this album or not, but he rehearsed the songs and he wanted to do it. And he brought his whole mega amplifier with uh, his dad rolling it in, like, in the car. But then when he came to the studio, I think we made him play it on a Face with bus on little TV or something. Uh, the album needed it, but you know, he wasn't too excited about it. That was the last thing uh, Dog uh, did for Dark Throne, but we thank you, man. That was just um, <coughs> a 
part we just listened to there had a uh, bona fide D-beat. The first time I actually heard D-beat was Celtic Frost. That's a, you know, like a, for those who are only into metal, that's a, that's a punk beat. The Celtic Frost had a lot of that. D-beat. Oh yeah, that was definitely a Bathory riff. Or is it? I don't fucking know where this riff came from. I wrote the entire fucking song, but don't know where the inspiration for this riff came. Probably Bathory, I don't know. And Celtic Frost again. Longest song I ever wrote, except for <laughs> the one I just made for uh, the Underground Resistance album, which turned out to be a little bit boring, so needed to fade that one. This one I didn't have to fade. This one worked perfectly. Clever written with these uh, mark du, 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 uh, which are rhythmically incorrect on purpose, but again inspired by Celtic Frost. Celtic Tom D probably was the mastermind of doing that at one point. All right. Ooh. What a snare drum sound, fantastic. <sighs> I didn't strip my uh, drum kit uh, down for this album. That was on Under Funeral Moon. I just had like one snare and one tom. I definitely had a couple of toms on this one. I guess we recorded the album in like four days and then did a couple of days on mixing something that was all we could afford probably cost like 25,000 kroner 2,500 English sterling pounds we didn't have that kind of money for uh, Soulside Journey we only had like a thousand pounds budget for that so we had to go to the Sunlight Studios where I wasn't even allowed to bring my own bass drums hence the D drum soulless drum sound on that one but this is the real McCoy and this is the might of battery you can hear right now World Without End, tribute to uh, King Diamond, uh, or of course Merciful Fate. But I guess you all knew that. <laughs> and on Soulside Journey, we had Lucifer Master, which was uh, a tribute to uh, Possessed. Always the 80s for us, man. There was the bass drum rolls again. It rolls into the snare. Don't know who first did that. I don't know where I got that from. I did it a lot uh, back here in 91.
All right, Catherine Lifeco, that was it. <laughs> Waspy guitar sound, uh, lots of reverb. And uh, this is Sapphirus. I made this. And the cowbell. To make the cowbell sound extra special, like Celtic Cross, like really dry and without like crunk, 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 like Motley Crue would have done, I stuffed lots of toilet paper inside the cowbell and just like put tape over it, so it'd be a really dry cowbell. I wish I still had that cowbell now, I'd fucking use it. Instead of playing do 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 do, Sapphires will go do 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 do. Just harve on the strings. I tell you, really fired up. I mean, introducing the vocalist like that, man. Ah, uh, that was Ted solo. I think I'm doing the next solo, actually. Or solo, I mean, it's not like Ingvi Momsten uh, quality, but... I just wanted some nasty stuff. The drums. <laughs> I do that shit anymore. That's too fancy. Fancy pants. And there's more Celtic Cross. I was Celtic Cross. The refrain and the verse here is Celtic Cross. The hearing and the rhythms really Celtic Cross. If I'd sung this, it would be totally Tom G. Warrior style. Probably best that uh, Ted sung this. Sounds a little bit more like us. This song changes rather extremely, I'd say, after this refrain right here. The clear, defined first and second part of the song. And I think I wrote the second part of the song. But we come to that now. Now right, here comes the first time we do like a Motorhead style thing. And the D beat again. Filthy Animal Taylor, old drummer for Motorhead, used to do this drum uh, style a lot. And here comes like a part we did for the Goat Lord album, but we integrated <laughs> or implemented. Uh, this part into this song. Yeah. 
No, that can't be right. It's gotta be like the last part or something. Like, dude, I don't know where this riff came from. Perhaps it wasn't Gold Lord, perhaps they made it for this song. Can't fucking remember. I was... <laughs> I could hear on the drumming that I was happy to return to this riff. Got a little bit tired playing the fast stuff. I was never really comfortable playing on that fast stuff. I like this beat. I still play this beat now, these days, a lot. My favorite beat. Later on, like, half of all black metal would have this tempo right here. Fucking boring. Also cloning. But again, that uh, tells us that there was really something about this this groove, if you can call it, that we're in right now. A friend of mine, the professor, said he listened to the commentary tracks on Total Death album and every time I said I didn't like a riff that was the ones he liked this is a part that's from uh, the Goat Lord sessions it sounds really great here with the uh, acoustic guitar we did some acoustic guitar again on our new album but since since we did it here with the acoustic guitar we hadn't done it since uh, Actually, we'd never done that before. We did that on the new album, Underground Resistance. We did some clear acoustic on uh, the Pelcandra demo and the Snowfall song. We should do more of that. I like it. Yeah, those two tracks we just listened to were black metal tracks. We made three of those for this album. And what you're listening to now is probably like those three of the songs we already had riffs from, from the Goat Lord sessions. And we just, I guess, played it in a more black metal style right here. People thought that all of these songs were black metal. We started playing like this death metal style of black metal. And we're the ones to blame for that. I'm <coughs> fucking sorry. I think if people listen more to like Sarcophago, the first Samuel album, NME for crying out loud, and Black Metal would have been better in the 90s. Except uh, instead, then people started copying this stuff a lot. And you know, the fast stuff. It's our fault, we dressed it up as black metal, people swallowed it and got influenced by it. Like this part right here is fucking death metal, man. Something like Dr. Shrinker could have made. I'm trying to destroy the riff with the double bass drums here, actually. I was angry at the riff, I didn't like it. It wasn't vast, it wasn't black metal. But it just, we... We had so little time, we had already booked the studio time for doing the Goat Lord album and we just thought, fuck it, let's go follow our hearts and play total, total black metal. And then, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't even have time, man. That's why we had to include this stuff. To us, this is a bona fide death metal riff. People just thought it was black metal. Another death metal riff. Awful. Doesn't work at all. Nah, 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 nah. Still a death metal riff, but this really works better here. Oh, 
underneath. And those little add-ons or cameos, I did all of those. Fancy drums. Who am I, like Neil Perk or something here? That's the Rush drummer, for those of you who don't know. I love the solo sound he's got going here. Guitar sounds great. Here actually comes the good part. I never listened to this song. But I can remember this part comes now. Fucking good. Come on! <laughs> Kinda majestic or something. Good songwriting with the uh, silence, silence bars there. Here we go again. Yeah, I can dig that. So song would be good if it was just this riff and that Dr. Shrinker riff I told you about earlier. Alright, that's the end of side one, side A on the vinyl. And then we start uh, side B with uh, the third, like, pure black metal track, Where Cold Winds Blow. Where warm winds blow today, actually. Ah! He's going swimming in the lake, but running from balls. So I was like, nah, don't feel like it. And now I'm doing this instead. Yeah, and uh. This is probably the m most 90s. I mean, the influences from, from from here came from Battery from the 80s and uh, what Mayhem was doing in 89, 90. We had like a cassette version of Live in Leipzig we listened to. You can hear this influence us. But we didn't figure Mayhem had anything to do with 90s or anything like that. I mean, this was 91 and everything we listened to were from the 80s or like from 1990 which would be like Monsters Hammer or Salmine nothing else was released in 90 but Li Live in Leipzig by Mayhem was recorded then you can hear we were inspired definitely Mayhem influence here Yeah, that, that's a type of riff that was really fresh, like, here in 91. And that got overplayed already, like, in 93 by so many bands. And in 97, everyone was doing it. And there's hordes of bands still doing this sound. Uh, if they do the Celtic Cross sound, I'd be more pleased with that. Because this got overplayed so fast. And I think I did the... I still try to do some... Some riff like this in on the uh, Pounce of House album, but it was so over for me, man. I ain't feeling it. You can hear it on the commentary tracks for uh, Pounce of House 2 that I was so over this sound, but I'll never be over the Celtic Cross stuff. So, 
of course I uh, worship the mayhem and the, the battery stuff like this but uh, didn't work for, for me to, to do it myself it was the Celtic Cross stuff that always worked also from the get-go I was inspired by Celtic Cross and Cryptic Slaughter my first band were inspired by those and also like the first Slayer album and lots of other shit Battery. Yeah, even though we tried to make like this is uh, like third black metal installation for this album, which should have just been an EP with where Colvin's blow in the shadow of the horns and Katharian Life Code. The songs I always end up playing from this album when I want to listen, it's Katharian Life Code and uh, in the shadow of the horns definitely two of our best tracks ever the rest of the album here I don't give a rat's ass about well I give a rat's ass but you know I don't really listen not anymore so this part right here doesn't work for me I don't know if it was allowed to drink in the studio. I think uh, it was just a little hill uh, outside the studio. I mean, the studio is uh, in the basement of like a, not a mall, but you know, a complex where you could there's different shops and shit. You could go buy beer. I'd buy plenty of beers. They get out to smoke some. And um, also drink. It was pretty much a wasted session. But uh, when we recorded stuff, we weren't that. We weren't that wasted. We weren't. I guess we weren't wasted at all. I can listen to my drumming here. And I definitely did this like as sober as could be. It was a Protestant way of doing it. <laughs> First, do a decent job, then get wasted. <laughs> Or hedonistic, as uh, someone else would would say. Maybe a lot of folks uh, hail this song. I just think it's a mess, man. I'm starting to think some of the death metal numbers on this album is better than this one. <laughs> the sound is genius. The amp that was used for these guitars it was so small it could fit in the glove compartment of a, of a car. that huge effect board man did wonders surprised no one else or people don't use that heck if I could get this sound again I'd do another one another album like this <laughs> just do the Catherine Life Code style Because it's a Katarian Life Call style that's like so 80s and it just works works for me. Alright, what song is this one? Huh. 
Oh, a blaze in the northern sky. Yeah, that's another small guest appearance by uh, myself. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Isn't this like directly one of the songs from uh, Gold Lord? I can hear we rehearse this a lot of times. Because this is, uh, we're fired up and uh, eager to play it. This is well rehearsed. But we're blacking it up definitely here. Boom, boom, boom. More Bathory. Another riff that's not 4-4 four, four beat. When I do riffs I always make them 4-4. Four, four. No, more fancy pants drumming. Hey, that's the cowbell again. We need more cowbell! No! Yeah, this part works. This is good. And these songs that are like from the Gold sessions, we all chipped in and made those songs. I don't remember who made what with. Nocturnal Culto made, Dog made a lot of it. Sapphires a little bit, I guess. And I made some. Sorry. Fenris vocals. God damn it! Well, I am dramatic. I'll give me that. Yeah, if this is not a battle between black metal or death metal, I'd say this song works better than where Cold Winds Blow. Just in the means of uh, general songwriting or flow or whatever. Aggressive metal. Did a lot of progressive with uh, our death metal we called, you know, as some of you know, technical horror death metal. And you could hear that there. Okay, final fucking track. It's 
see this uh, riff is supposed to be like a doom metal beat but I played it like this because I thought that was more black metal I should have just played it like the doom metal beat would have worked way better a lot of people won't agree because they're used to this but you know I know what works I can have whatever opinion I want with my own fucking music <laughs> I can hear the way I portion out my words, so I'm starting to get inspired by uh, Dylan Hughes' radio show, Maniac Monday. <laughs> Alright, Dylan. The wind of the 666 has been achieved. Okay, drama queen. Alright, more about the revives right here. A lot of people like this album when it came out because, you know, looking at the cover, no one did album covers like that in 91. Everything was like painted or airbrushed. What do you know? I don't know. And we just had like one member of the band in black and white photo with corpse paint on the cover. Just reminded everyone about 80s and this was also, you know, as I told you a million times, inspired purely by the 80s. And there's a lot of Celtic Cross and Bathory in it. But the fusing of those two bands, like combining it, that wasn't out on album until this one. So I guess that was fresh for a lot of people and they liked it. Probably still do, for all I care. And I mean, when I started doing a lot of interviews again in 98, a lot of people would ask me from time to time, what's your favorite song, man? But again, as you can hear me doing comments on these tracks, there are some parts that I say really works, other parts don't work. And you're completely blind while doing the songs, you think everything works, and then you get into hindsight, like many years later, you see what works and what don't. So I'd always answer like, nah, I ain't got many fave songs, I got fave parts. Then he asked like, fave albums? No, I ain't even got fave songs, I got fave parts. This is the riff I hate most on this album. I'm trying to destroy it by my drumming. Again with the double bass drums, trying to crush the riff. But it, it's not even a good death metal riff. I think it's you Nielsen that made it. Didn't really work for us. But you made many other great riffs, man. Eternal. Just heard of playing mistakes on the guitars. <laughs> ah, again with his fucking riff. someone poured this riff on my cereal, I just had to throw it in the waste bin, man. Should I, like, rate the songs for this album? I think this doesn't work. For me, I think... Pagan Winter and Where Cold Winds Blow are actually the ones that works least for me. Then uh, Paragon Belial and the Blazing Northern Sky probably on uh, shared second place and Catherine and Life Cold and in the Shadow of the Horns definitely shared first place. Ah! Celtic Frost Deluxe Riff. This song was like directly from the Goat Lord sessions, I don't know, but even in the Goat Lord sessions we included uh, Celtic Frost and there's like one riff on Soulside Journey that uh, was inspired by Celtic Frost. And there's almost no Dark Throne albums without Celtic Frost uh, riffs or influences. I mean, when I say Celtic Frost riffs, we don't fucking s steal them. It's just the vibe, man inspired by that. 
Thank you, that's a wrap. Oh yeah, it's a fucking outro again. Well, thanks to you for listening. I hope you had a ball. As many balls as ACDC. Alright, this was Fenris doing commentary tracks for a Blaze and Northern Sky album, recorded summer of 91. Songs were done in, like, from the end of uh, 1990 till, yeah, well, May, perhaps even June 91. The album didn't come out until way later. I always have a problem when, uh, when I check for release years. I want to know when, where albums, when albums are recorded, not necessarily released. The recording date should be the true date for dating an album. Speed dating an album. Bye now.